Hello, everyone, and welcome to our studio. Jack Steinmetz, born in Czechoslovakia, August, October 31st, 1929. During the Nazi invasion, he was sent to several death camps, and here he is to tell his story. First of all, welcome, Jack. Welcome to our studio. Thank you. How are you? I, I'm okay, thank you for uh, old man. Ah, you're not old. Don't think about that. You're a young heart. You're, you're as young as you, you feel. So, Jack, I know you have an amazing story. Amazing. Um, and, and I'm so happy you're here with us to share it. And, I, and if it's okay, I want you to, you know, tell us the story going back to actually the story of your survival. Of you actually been, if I'm not mistaken, it was in Auschwitz, where you were actually sent to the gas chamber. And I mean, you're, you're here to tell us the story. You tell your story. When I, uh, we grew up, it was uh, in a small village. I went to uh, Jewish school and the public school. And uh, when I became Bar Mitzvah, my parents sent me to uh, Yeshiva, to uh, in Yarmut, where my grandmother had a brother that was living there. And mm -hmm. I stayed with them and went to Yeshiva. And um, for Pesach, I came home. And after Pesach, we went back. This happened the first year. And the second year I was there, I again, I went to the Yeshua and I came home for Pesach. And by then the uh, Germans have occupied uh, Hungary. As a matter of fact, uh, the officer in charge of the troops that were in our village uh, was built in our house because we had a nice uh, spare room there <laughs> and uh, he, he was actually staying there and um, there was, it was I, as I, said, I came home for Pesach and uh, at the last uh, Pesach was over the next morning my father went outside and there was a guard in front of our house so he asked him, why, what happened? What, did you do something? Why is the God? He, he says, no, all the Jewish homes have a God in front of their face. Wow, like overnight? And, like, I'm just, yeah, I'm just yeah. wondering. When like, woke up in the morning after Pesach, yes. Wow. And so they, um, anyway, uh, by uh, later in the day, they sent uh, a messenger uh, out to all the Jewish homes. One came to our place. And we were told to pack, everybody pack one suitcase, and we're gonna have to be, they're moving us out of the home, we're gonna have to meet at the public school. So we went, uh, what can you do? Um, uh, my father wasn't home, he was at the army, but not, uh, the, the Jews were not allowed in the army, they were workers, they were working for the army. And, uh, uh, but for, he was allowed home for Pesach, for uh, he had a leave, so he mm -hmm. was there with us. We went uh, into the, the school, or slept overnight on the course on the floor, and uh, next uh, morning uh, we were escorted out, we said everybody pack uh, your suitcase, and we were escorted out to the railroad station. And they put us in on this open freight cars and took us into the next city, which was called uh, uh, in Czech, Sablus. In, in Yiddish, it was not in uh, Sablus. And uh, they, we went to a ghetto there. We stayed there. And uh, a few weeks, there, I don't remember exactly time. I was a, still a young uh, yeah. uh, kid. I was about 14 then. And um, after uh, uh, two or three weeks, they, they, uh, we were uh, told to pack our suitcase and they took us out to the train station 
and put us in, in those cattle cars, which everybody was, I think saw after how this was done. And uh, we were on the train for about two days, uh, if I remember correctly. Can I just ask you something? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but all ahead, during, this, time. <laughs> during this time, nobody told you why, I mean, why they decided to remove you from your home, take they, everything they you've got. They're, they're taking us to work. That's Whether you like it or not. The, yeah, the Jews uh, have to go to work. And that, that's what we were told. Wow. And of course, okay. uh, it, it was very, it was crowded. You know, we were stopped. Uh, there was no room to, for anybody to lay down. You could hardly sit down. Uh, there was not that, not that much room. And there was one pail there for water that somebody could get a water and also to go to the washroom, another pail. Anyway, we arrived the next day. Of course, we didn't know where, where we were, but the found later out. And we got the, it was Birkenau, not Auschwitz. Uh, Auschwitz okay. uh, about a kilometer or something like that away from uh, Birkenau. And the uh, crematorium actually was in Birkenau. So when they opened those cattle cars, we heard uh, dog, dogs barking, we saw German soldiers with their rifles and yelling, rouse, rouse. And everybody had to go out. Then they separated the women in, in one um, row and the men separately. And the children, the younger ones, were sent with, with, with the women mostly. Anyway, I was, uh, we were still together, the family because uh, I was uh, older, you know, I was uh, 14 uh, years old by then. I was my father, mother, and I had two younger brothers and my grandmother we were together. And that's when I saw Mangala first. He was there to direct when we were going by to the right or to the left. And uh, that's, we were separated then. My grandmother, my two younger brothers, and my mother were sent to one side, and my father and I were to, went to another side. Uh, the men were separated for the moment completely. <clears throat> and then uh, when this, uh, everybody was set up in the row, they, they marched us to uh, the camp, uh, the gates were, you know, big iron gates. I think everybody saw, saw them, what they looked like. Um, and uh, they took us into a place um, where there was showers. Uh, we had to undress and get washed. And then they took everybody that cut we got our hair cut all over the body. Uh, and uh, I, at that time, I was still together with my father. And then uh, they lined us up and they put on the tattoos on our arms. And uh, uh, then they handed out these uh, striped clothes that uh, also uh, most people have seen what they looked like. Uh, uh, and we were taken to a barrack. Um, and there were these cuts, uh, uh, I don't know how to, to, to call them. There were rows of these that where you were sleeping together. There was, of course, no mattress or anything, just on the wooden boards. And there was one blanket. <clears throat> And for a few days, my father was there with me. We were in the same, uh, we were actually sleeping together. And then uh, one day, uh, every morning there was uh, called appell. We had to go outside the barracks, line up six in a row, and they would count always to make sure that no nobody has uh, somehow escaped. Um, one day uh, after the roll call, my father was taken out 
and it was shipped away and I never saw him before, never saw him after. Um, I found out after here in Canada, when we were in Canada, uh, Carol, my daughter, as a matter of fact, was searching to see if uh, there was any information that he died in Dachau and we have the date of when, when, he, when he died. I just, I, I know it's very hard to tell the story. I just wanted to ask, at that time, you know, in the beginning, they told you you're going, all the Jews had to go to work. Yeah. But once you arrived in the camp, you saw what's going on. Did no one, I mean, I know you were a young boy, but did no one realize what was going on? Nobody knew? Oh, yes, I was going to come to that. Uh, I was just uh, wanted to get, um, I, I don't want to mix things up. Uh, that my That's father okay. left, I, I was left by myself with my strangers and kids my, my, own, my own age. But a few days after we were there, there were couples in the camp and uh, most of them were actually Jewish couples. We found out that the, the women and the, the young children that were sent on the other uh, plane, they were straight, marched straight to the crematorium. We, we found out there and then that my, my, my mother and grandmother and my two younger brothers were sent to the crematorium. So there was, that was a little information we have. Of course, we didn't know from outside about the war, how it's going, we never knew anything. And this went on, there was the appel every, every morning and they, they did the counting and then we went out of the camp with the armed guards to work. There was, we went we were clearing bushes from uh, a hill uh, there and carrying the, the stuff to, to one side. Um, once uh, in a while, Mangala, came to oversee the appel, you know, the, every morning the, when they were counting that, and he would supervise. Uh, this. And um, this happened twice. Uh, well, he, he came one time and he had, uh, us young children had to go, he had a, a riding crop, as one of those sticks for the use of when they ride a horse, he put it out like that on his hand, and we had to walk under it. If you reached it, you went back in line to your row. If you were too short, you didn't reach it, then you were sent out of the line. And of course, by then we knew you were going to the crematorium. So I was always short. And when I was coming, I realized I wasn't going to be able to reach the stick. So I went a little bit on my tiptoes, and I managed to reach the stick, I passed. This happened twice. The third time when he did this was on Yom Kippur Day. Uh, they handed out in the morning, we had a piece of bread with some warm uh, thing, it was supposed to be coffee, but of course there wasn't, wasn't coffee. And um, on Yom Kippur morning, somebody knew and they, uh, yelled, uh, today is Yom Kippur. So I just put the bread in my pocket because uh, I, I didn't want to eat the Yom Kippur. So on the appel, Mengele arrived, he was there, and he did the same thing. You had to go under there with, with that stick. And uh, I did the same thing what I did twice before. I went on my tiptoe on this time he noticed he made me turn turned around, I had to go back, and of course, I, without um, tiptoeing, I couldn't reach it, and he was, I was sent to the other side where to go to the crematorium. So when the appel was finished, those that were sent to the side, they were marched uh, to the state to the crematorium, told to get undressed. We had our clothes in front of our thing, and at that point, a German officer with a couple came in the door where we came in, where we were brought in, and he announced, of course, in German, uh, and I, I could understand because I spoke Yiddish, so I understood, understood German. He announced that he needed um, 
volunteers for a job detail. They didn't say what kind of a job. <clears throat> Hold on, you, I just want to make sure you were already in. Undressed, Undressed naked. We were in the uh, outside room from the crematorium. The doors were open. We could see, we could see in there. <clears throat> and um, we knew what was waiting for us by then. Anyway, this German officer with a couple came in and he announced that he wanted some volunteers. So I, because I understood I was one of the first to go close to where they were to volunteer and the couple just quickly get go, get dressed, put, put on some clothes. So I was gonna go about two rows away where I got undressed to get my fans and a jacket and he said, no, 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 don't go, just grab anything here. You want to go in there, he said, to show him to the crematorium, hurry up, we got to get out of here. Wow, this is amazing. So I, I got, well, I, the reason I wanted to go and get mine, because I still had my own belt from home, and I wanted to get it, but uh, I, I could. Anyway, they, uh, we got dressed, and they took out, and they, by then, while we were getting dressed, they opened up the door, and they, and they were pushing the people in into the, in the gas chamber. So when we went out, we were, they took us back out the door where we came in, and there, the Sondra Commando, they were the people that were carrying out the bodies from the crematorium, from the gas chamber to the crematorium. They were waiting there, and when we came back out, they started yelling in Yiddish, what happened? How come they, you came out? Nobody comes back out. He said. Yeah. So, well, we tried to tell them, we don't know, we're just uh, taking us to work. And uh, I, I, I'm going to stop you, Jack. Jack, you know, it was meant to be because they could have had many other workers. I, I, this is what, to this day, yeah. I, I can't get it out of my head. Why did he come in to get work? They had thousands of people in the camp. They had enough people for work. It's because the, only to... thing, the only thing that makes any sense that that particular German officer had some, um, or, you know, feelings uh, felt sorry for, for young kids being uh, sent to gas chamber and he had an opportunity to save some. That's the maybe, only thing maybe, I you, maybe you're here because you know you need to tell their story. Yeah. Somebody had to survive to tell their story. I don't know. I don't know the mystery of life. I don't know. Well, and I'm I glad you're here. I, I honestly, I still can't believe that I I was already so close, I undressed to go to the crematorium and, and then I, I survived. And David wow. Marks, David Marks. And there was, a, um, um, after we came to, yeah. to Canada, I'll, I'll get, get out of the, um, you know, uh, jump ahead a little bit. That's okay. And we, when we came out to Canada, I went always to ask for the, uh, try to find out if anybody else, because there was about 18 of us I, that came out. Right. Uh, 14 or 18. Uh, anyway, I can't remember exactly how many. We, we were assigned to work on the, it's called, the, it was called the Scheisse wagon. We were taking uh, the garbage out of the camps. Mm -hmm. uh, from our camp where we were, we, uh, we, I went to the women's camps too. We took the camp. We took, we took from there too, and we even went to the, uh, it was called actually Canada camp, where they stored all the loot, the, the, what they took from the people that came out from the wagons. The, everything was stored high there. Uh, uh, I've never seen eyeglasses so many, suitcases and, and shoes and everything was, was there because we were guaranteeing that also to take garbage out. I saw that. Anyway, when we came to Canada, uh, I tried to find out if anybody from that group that came out from the, from the crematorium, if they know if anybody survived, uh, is here. 
always the answer was no, no, they didn't hear from nobody, nothing. Wow. And uh, one Let's day go back. when I when Let's I go back to that day. Pardon? Let's go back to that time. Okay, I just have to finish this one thing. Sure, absolutely. Um, one day when I was asking if anybody, you know, I was told somebody else asked the same question and he left the phone number there and they gave me the phone number and it turns out it was one of the guys that came out with me from the yes. from the uh -huh. crematorium. And uh, the reason we didn't hear from him before, he lived in Halifax and he just moved here to Toronto not too long before. Wow, that's and amazing. Met, and he just lived, I live here at the corner of Young and, and Clark, and he lived where Sobeys is, just a block away. That's wow, that, that is amazing. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to jump ahead and just mention that yes. one, one um, I did meet one that came out from the, wow. Um, so to go back, we were going to do work and uh, we didn't know anything what's going on as far as the war, who is winning or who is losing. We didn't know nothing. And this went down, uh, Paul came and uh, um, by the way, uh, one thing I forgot to mention when I was being marched to the crematorium, I said I didn't eat my, my piece of bread for breakfast. I took it out of my pocket. I ate it. I said, I'm not going to go hungry. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> uh, so, um, fall came. It started to get cold. It was win winter time already. And one day they announced that tomorrow morning when we got up, when we got up after the appeal, pack everything into a uh, bag or whatever and because they're taking us out of Birkenau we are being taken away oh. and that was called the death march because we were of course lined up in the sixth uh, in, in a row and they said make sure you keep up they can't stop for a rest or for anything. Uh, they're gonna stop uh, only uh, at some point to, uh, to go to the washroom for a few minutes. But if you um, don't keep up with the way you are walking, you, everybody's gonna get shot. There's nobody's gonna uh, be left alive to escape or anything. So we marched all day like this, and uh, it was already winter time, snow on the ground, and we actually slept outside in the snow the first night. And then the next morning we again continued with the march, and the second night, luckily there was some kind of an empty barn, and they let us go in there instead of being outside in the snow. And after then, the, the next morning, they took us, uh, there was a railroad station, they took us there and put us in, again, in this open um, freight uh, cars where they carry freight and um, took us to uh, another camp for, for a moment, no, I can't think of that name. It's okay, don't worry, it's okay if you don't remember. Yeah, they took us to this uh, other camp. Right. And uh, we were uh, there, and again, nobody knows nothing about the war, where, where we are. And um, one day there was an uh, American or uh, English, uh, I, mean, I don't remember for sure, uh, they bombed. In, in the area, and one bomb fell near near the camp. Okay. But, uh, it didn't uh, hit inside the camp. And um, we were there for a, a few weeks, and then they started emptying out that camp too. And we were marched uh, a few hours away, not too far away, to another camp, this one was in a forest. 
uh, muddy and very, very cold. And uh, I was getting to be very, very weak because even the food that we used to get twice a day at this other camp, it, some days they were missed. They, I don't know whether they were running out of food or what, but it, anyway, it was very bad. I, I was um, getting very weak. I could hard, hardly walk. One night, a rumor went into the camp that the guards in the front of the camp, uh, there's no guard, they disappeared. Well, nobody wanted to believe it. We didn't believe it, but it was so pitch dark in the, in the forest that we, we couldn't even go to check. First thing in the morning, um, when we woke up, we went to the front and sure enough, there was no guard. The gates were open. Wow. Oh. And we just walked, started walking out. There was no, um, it was out in the open, no city or anything. Um, there was a, road, a small road there we were on. And then we heard trucks going by a little distance, couldn't see it. So we started walking through where there was, and there was a highway there. And at first we thought there were German trucks going by through, but it turned out it was the Americans. Wow. And that's how we were liberated. That's how we were oh. found out. Oh my God. That is amazing. And wow. I was so weak. Oh yeah, well as the American troops drove by, they couldn't stop because they were in a convoy, but they were throwing cans of food down because they saw the refugees there. And I picked up a can. Of course, we didn't know what it was. It was, a, well, I didn't have nothing to open with. I found a stone. <laughs> I found a stone and I made a hole and it was chicken soup. <laughs> it was delicious. It was very good. And it was, of course, it was cold. And I started drinking it. And next thing I, I came back out, my stomach couldn't hold it. It was, you know, yeah. it was, fatty and that I gave it back out and I passed out. Of course, I didn't know. The next thing I woke up, I was in a hospital. They found me there and uh, there was an American run hospital uh, with German doctors and nurses. Really? And with found, German I hold out on. after hold I. On. Hold on, Jackie. Hold on, Jack. You said American and British with German, German doctors? Yeah, well, there was a German hospital. They okay, were, okay. well, there was German, I mean, American doctors there too, but uh, it, it was basically an uh, American uh, supervised hospital. American, uh, okay. Yeah. And um, anyway, um, after a few days, I, beginning, I woke up and I, I found out that I had typhus. And uh, I was very weak. I stayed there for uh, a few weeks. And then I made friends with another boy that also was, uh, was one of the survivors. And we started walking out into the town where where uh, was close to. And we spoke, we were able to understand the German. So we found out where the train station is because uh, I was beginning to think, you know, okay, we got to try to make our way home, find out if any of the family survived. My, well, I knew my mother and grandmother didn't, and brother, but my father, I didn't know. So, um, then, we, of course, we went back to the camp, and we started asking questions, what's going to happen, when are they going to let us... Uh, go home. They said, well, it's going to be a while. The war is still going on. And um, you just have to wait. Well, uh, I wasn't very patient to wait. Uh, we decided with this other boy, we went to the train station to found out where if I want to go to a home, first we have to go to, Czechs uh, to uh, Prague and then from there to Budapest to go to Hungary. So, and we found out also that as refugees, you can get on the train, you don't need money for the ticket. Because of course we didn't have money. <laughs> so 
after a little while when we saw nothing was happening, this little mother boy and I, we decided we were going to go on our own, try to make our way home. So we went, got on the train to Prague, and I won, we went in to found out where the Jewish uh, uh, community center or whatever it was is. And we went there and they sent us to a doctor. And uh, uh, no, they did not there. They gave us some clothes and money to buy tickets to go to Budapest because from there we couldn't go on the train without paying. So uh, we got on the train to go to Budapest and uh, again made our way back into the uh, Jewish community center and there they sent me, we were separated there, this friend of mine, we said goodbye and I don't know where he went to. Um, they sent me to a doctor and they found out that beside what I had the typhus, I had TB on my left lung. Yeah. And there was no medication available for TB. All they could do is send me to a city in the mountain, and the mountain air helps to heal it to heal on its own. So that's what it is. I, they sent me there, and I was there. And uh, after a few weeks, it did heal. I the actually showed okay, and I was discharged. So I made my <coughs> way to the fire Jarmut where I went to Yeshiva there. And uh, in case anybody survived from the family there. And um, I found out that there was two of the sons of my uncle there. They survived, but one went to try to go to then uh, Palestine. And one was home, he was there. And um, mm -hmm. He also told me that you, the place where I was born in Salon is occupied by, you, by the Russians. And uh, if you go home, they won't let you out. And uh, as far as he knows, no, nobody uh, from the family survived. So I stayed with him for a, a little while and there was another cousin from my grandmother's uh, side. This one called was uh, from a, he, she had a, an, another relative in, uh, lived in Sotmar. And he came over from, that was Romania, he came over by motorcycle to visit uh, where I was. And he asked me if I want to go and stay with him for a little while, see what happens about going home. So I went with him to actually smuggle me over to, to Romania. And uh, he just got married a few weeks before. And uh, I, I knew the girl that he married because I met her when I was a young kid. I went visiting them. They lived not very far from where we live. I mean, in another town, but uh, I went there visiting them, so I knew knew her. And um, uh, where was I now? Uh, okay. It's okay. Where were we? Yeah, I, I them in in, in South Park. Okay. And uh, uh, I tried. I tried to get me a job too, because he asked me, "What do I think I would done?" For some reason. I, I never, we didn't have cars in, in our town where we lived, except once I saw a car that came, my mother was sick. And from the city, from the other city, from Salish, a doctor came with my car. That's the first time I saw a car that time as a kid. Can I just ask you, how old, how old were you, um, you know, when you uh, were liberated? Uh, well, I was uh, about 14 and a half. About 14 and a half, okay. I came out to, um, no, just a minute. Uh, okay, Jack. Doesn't matter. I just want to know, how did you get, how did you get 
to Canada. Well, that's... Uh, uh, that's uh, another, another story. story. <laughs> okay, so I said, when uh, after a while, a few months, um, the uh, cousin that I stayed with, actually was a second cousin, um, th they decided that they want to go to then Palestine. But it turns out they, they never made it. It was very hard to go. And they, uh, they came to Canada. But of course, at that time, I didn't know because we separated there. And I wanted to go to Palestine too. So we had to go to Austria. Uh, there was a, a school there where refugees were, were um, housed and until they found the place where they want to go to immigrate to. So anyway, I made myself my way back to Hungary and this cousin in, in uh, uh, Fahir Jarmat, where they were, he sent, they were shipping apples to Budapest by truck. And he spoke to the driver that he should give me a ride and, and, and the truck to Budapest and I went back there with the idea of trying to go to Palestine. So I went to the, the uh, Shomer over there. They were a, a group where they were, uh, had the young uh, people uh, learning a little bit to, to say words in Hebrew and uh, sing some song mm -hmm. in Hebrew and that we are going to go to Palestine. But in order for that, we had to go to Austria, so they shipped us by train across the the border to Austria, and uh, I went to uh, the office there to say, uh, you know, I give my information, my name, and that I want to go to Palestine. And they said, okay, boys, your age, you're going to have a long wait because first they're sending the women, especially if they are in pregnant women, then the older people, we're going to have to wait and the ships are being, uh, the English are not uh, cooperating, they're, um, you know, making yeah. it very difficult. So I found out that there was a children's camp there in Munich, near, near Munich, Aklasterhausen. And I made my way to that camp, <clears throat> and there was a, a woman, uh, a Jewish woman from uh, United States running that camp. And uh, she registered me to go and join the camp because she could see that I was a refugee. And because you, most of the others never went home to try go home, they went straight to that camp. Anyway, so I was there in that camp and with the idea of waiting to go to Palestine. Where else am I going to go? Oh, um, I just remembered something. My grandmother had a brother living in, in Brooklyn in the United States. His name was Mermelstein. Her, my grandmother's maiden name was Mermelstein. And we corresponded, of course, from home originally by, by mail. And when things started to go wrong, they decided that they're going to bring us out to, um, to America. So they applied, the, you know, for papers, visas, and everything. They actually got the visa for the whole family to go to America. But by the time we received it at home by, in the mail, they closed the border, they wouldn't let us out. But I knew, so I, as that's how I knew that I had an uncle in, in Brooklyn, he had, they had a butcher shop and I knew his name, but I didn't remember the address. So when I went, you know, when I uh, um, came to, back to Austria, they said, you know, do you have any relatives anywhere where you can go? That, mm -hmm. so I mentioned that I had this uncle there, and they took the information. And because I didn't have an address, they said, well, we can't promise that they're going to be able to find them. Brooklyn is not a small town. But they, they sent in the information. 
So I didn't hear, of course, nothing back for uh, a time. They announced at one time in the camp that Canada, for the first time, is going to take refugee children, Jewish children, to let them in to Canada. But you have to be under 18. Well, I was under 18. Mm -hmm. So I said, OK, uh, I can't go to Palestine. I don't know when. They don't even give a, get any information yet. So I'll try to go to Canada. And then maybe from there, I'll try to go to Mm-hmm. So I registered. They took us in by uh, uh, the the camp um, leader. They had a, a military uh, truck there available. They took us into the consulate, uh, the Canadian consulate in uh, the next town there where the consulate was. And uh, you had to pass uh, health uh, uh, and age, you know. So <laughs> I, I passed the health test, and I was refused. Everybody got the visa that went out. I was refused the visa because I had to be under 18. The ship would go from Halifax to to Canada, uh, no, from uh, Germany to Halifax, and it would arrive in November the 6th in, in Halifax, and my birthday when I was 18 would be October 31. So I would be a one week older than I should wow. be. Yeah, and that's why they refused my visa. So we went back to the camp. I was heartbroken, you know, everybody is, is going and I can go. Wow. And I told the lady, that the camp commander, what happened, she got very angry. She said, how can those Canadians be so stupid as the word that she used? You are a young man. <laughs> you are still under, eight, you're still under 18 now. You're not 18. Right. You're going to be, because the ship is going slow, you're going to be a week late. But you're already going to be on a Canadian ship. So she phoned up the, the consulate. And she spoke not in a nice voice. She was angry. <laughs> anyway, she got you on. To send me back the next day, and they gave me the visa. And that's awesome. how. <laughs> that's how you end up in Canada, Jack. You have an amazing story. I, I know. I know. There's a continuation to that story, but we're running out of time. But I want you to come back. I mean, it's amazing. And it's amazing that you're here to tell us the story. Um, one, one thing I would like to add yeah. is just only a moment. No While I was in the children's camp, that's where I met my wife that I married here. Awesome. Oh, wow. And I know, I mean, next time we have to have your lovely daughter on with you, Carol. Um, amazing story. I'm so happy that you're here to tell us, uh, to tell us, you know, an eyewitness of what happened. And I mean, you were a child, yeah. you know. I, I, I have know. another daughter, by the way, three years older than Carol. Okay, I only met Carol, I only know Carol, so we can have your other daughter on as well. No problem, it would be my pleasure. Because I know you have another story and, and I'll, I'll keep the viewer in suspense because it's the second part of the story is just as amazing. Jack, thank you so much, and we'll make arrangements for you to come back again. And I hope this world will never see another Nazi Germany ever again. I hope we can have peace for yeah, the rest I mean, of the, all generation to come, because no people should suffer what the Jewish people did. I mean, no one. Thank you, Jack, and hope thank to you. see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Shana and for, for our viewers, I'm going to say thank you for joining us, and I will see you next week.